14% of our population currently is over 65, but by the year 2056, one in every four people will be over 65. The number of people aged over 85 will also continue to increase. The chance of being in a nursing home will continue to increase. So I don't like that I'm one few people who have kicked over 55. You know, I don't like that I'm one of the few of my cousins that still remains fit and healthy and not having to inject myself or medicate myself every day. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of a deal. You can imagine the elderly person being represented in this way. They talk about stereotyping, stigmatisation, marginalisation, invisibility, infantilisation, medicalisation, and I would argue that the elderly are probably the only group in society who suffer from underuse, overuse and misuse of medication and treatments all at the same time. Um, welfareism, dehumanisation and trivialisation. Preventative health policy, however, as we've also heard from our previous two speakers and others, should be ageless. It should be fair and equitable. A whole-of-life approach to vaccination is needed and uh, uh, this uh, should uh, be equi equitably accessible at all ages. So what we're left with is vaccination. It's the only modality that has been shown to protect these people from going through this event. The cost of uh, unsubsidised vaccines is considerable. I've made allusion already to the $250 for a very effective vaccine, the shingles uh, Zostavax, which I might say has been subject to the largest uh, single vaccination study in older people uh, ever conducted in the history of humanity. Vaccination really is low-hanging fruit for prevention of disease. Vaccines are safe and effective. Influenza and pneumococcal vaccines are provided free for people over 65. But we know that vaccination rates for the free adult vaccines are much lower than they are for free childhood vaccines, 50 to 70 per cent compared to over 90 per cent for every single one of the 12 childhood vaccinations that are provided free. Research also shows that doctor recommendation is the strongest predictor of vaccination. So why don't doctors believe in vaccination for the elderly? As with many other healthcare decisions, much power and responsibility rests with the clinicians through the provision of information to manage interests around a hypothetical situation. If I do this, then that will happen. This is even more telling for preventive health and vaccination. The problem is not only the shingles, but it's the development of post-hepatic neuralgia that uh, can affect so many people. And basically about of those, particularly in the elderly group, 20, at least 20% will develop this condition. This highlights the true ethical responsibility for preventive health care decisions, particularly when, as is the case for vaccination, these treatments are being made available. For older people, such decisions should arise from dialogue and avoid the assumptions on behalf of the clinician that this treatment would be inappropriate and therefore not wanted by the person, or that any treatment which can be undertaken must be by exploring goals of care and focusing decisions towards these goals. So the impact of vaccine preventable illness on nursing home residents, we have to think beyond death and there was a very good presentation just before lunch looking at frailty and I think that if you look at most of the papers that look at vaccine preventable illnesses and, and other illnesses in older people we have this focus on death but we do need to look at the other outcomes. We do need to look at the impact on morbidity, um, particularly delirium for example, distress from dyspnea. Um, we need to look at the impact of, um, of those illnesses on disability and dependency and therefore reduced quality of life because the more dependent people are, the re there, there certainly are reductions in quality of life. One of the issues that happens in residential aged care, for example, is that once people dip into that disability threshold and they become a burden for staff in terms of helping them transfer, for example, one of the responses in many institutions is to put them into a water chair, for example, and to use a hoist for transfers. And so you've got this sort of catch-22 or this, this vicious cycle of frailty and disability, if you like, that once somebody is in that sort of environment, they're not standing and they're not transferring, they're using hoists, they're in water chairs where they're lying looking up at the ceiling, they've got decreased social connections, decreased quality of life, and it's very hard to reverse that once it occurs. Epistemic vulnerability, um, or epistemic injustice, as Miranda Fricker talks about it, is the denial of recognition of the other person's experience, and that happens in two ways amongst the 
the elderly. The first is the actual denial of their experience, but the second is the denial of research into their experience. The fact that we know so little, the fact that there is so little research that's expended on the elderly for these specific areas is something that we need to address as a society and as a body of researchers. This recognition reinforces the need for informed and respectful discussions between clinicians, patients and families of the benefits and burdens of preventive health measures for older people as an expanded sense of advanced care planning. How good is good enough? Well, I think good enough is taking every opportunity to help people maximise their quality of life throughout the life course, including at older age and in residential care, because people are actually spending a reasonable period of their life within residential care. When you talked about qualities, one of the first things that came into my head is women live longer than men. Women have fewer resources than men, they have less superannuation than men, they have less savings than men. So when that decision about how long how worthwhile or how many qualities you're worth is going to disproportionately affect half of the population. So some of those notions of symbolic violence, the way that people are spoken about, the way they're represented, how the elderly are discussed as bed blockers in ED, all of that has a profound effect in the way that we deliver and fund services. So of course older people can't afford to lose their functional reserve, so functional reserve is really the name of the game and so Something like a vaccine preventable illness, be it, um, be it influenza, be it pneumonia, um, something that is particularly going to result in people um, um, reducing their activity, um, going to bed, um, is going to result in, a, in a, um, an impact on their functional reserve that can allow them or can make them dip into that disability threshold. So if you were all put to bed for a week, um, on strict bed rest, if you had, if you had pneumonia, for example, um, you'd feel a bit woozy when you got out of bed after that week, but you have enough functional reserve that you're not, dis that, that, that you're not going to become disabled, and that's not the case with older people. How is pneumonia anyone's friend? The glass is half full. Pneumonia is no one's friend. Seniors do have a higher burden of disease and more serious complications. Infections are unique because preventing one infection prevents transmission to others. A vaccine can't protect against something it's not designed to protect against. For example, all cause pneumonia or all strains of influenza. So don't be so surprised that it doesn't. Vaccine waning doesn't matter as much in the elderly. Vaccines with lower efficacy have public health impact if disease burden is high. And vaccines are more effective in the elderly than many accepted public health interventions. Looking after old people is about holism and being holism isn't about exclusion. It's about including a whole community in the care of someone, recognising the role that old people have, um, that the story of your family and of your community over the ages is within that person who is the aged person. Um, and for us, it's within that person who is older than you or me. Mm -hmm.